1972, a crack commando unit was sent to prison by a military court for a crime they didn't commit. These men promptly escaped from a maximum security stockade to the Los Angeles underground. Today, still wanted by the government, they survive as soldiers of fortune. If you have a problem, if no one else can help, and if you can find them, maybe you can hire the AT. to another episode of Full Throttle TV. This is the first episode of our second season. If you missed our little breaks in the middle, we had a Back to the Future special and a Smokey and the Bandit special. I'm your host, Michael, and my co-creator and co-host, Ron. Say hi. Raul. <laughs> oh, boy. Sorry. <clears throat> Flashback. Ron. Yeah, that's me. Yes, I, the very first week that I met him, I actually thought his name was Raul Millington. <laughs> Millingham. Millingham. I was way off. You gave me an identity crisis. I did. I did it on purpose, actually. I planned this for years to come, and then the day came, and I was just like, I'm going to destroy everything you know! <laughs> <laughs> All and right. it's slow and work. It only took 30 years, 25 yeah. years. <laughs> I'm very patient. I'm a very patient evil man. Uh, this week, go. we will be discussing the A-Team Stingray, and we did discuss Highwayman back in the, I believe, the second episode of Season 1. But we actually finally got to see some episodes. It's very hard to track down. Uh, hush, hush, wink, wink. We didn't find it in the right way. Um, <laughs> but if they're not going to release it on DVD, that's uh, that's our problem. Uh, mm. So the first show we're going to discuss, of course, is The A-Team. And I think this was one of those shows that everybody knows. If you haven't Uh-oh. seen like the whole season, you've at least caught an episode. You have a general idea of what it is. That's what I was thinking myself I'm like you got iconic vehicle cars I, I was gonna i had this written in my head it says practically anybody from our era or that era would know this show if they saw a black van with red stripe what's the first thing you would think of yeah exactly so very iconic yeah and it's funny is that usually we uh, we talk about like awesome motorcycles and uh, cars and the van isn't exactly known for being <laughs> you know, like, oh, it's all about speed. I mean, the show is called Full Throttle, and why are we talking about vans? But it's not so much about fast vehicles, it's about iconic vehicles. Because the next episode we're doing obviously isn't going to be very fast because we're going to be talking about the Addams Family and the Monsters. So catch that next month for our Halloween special. And um, the one thing I liked about the A Team was that it was one of those shows, and this is kind of the trend back then, is you could just watch one episode and be fine, miss five come back and then watch another episode and you wouldn't miss anything. You're just like, oh, all right. Same thing's the same. You know, I don't have to go back and try to catch all the episodes. Except towards the end, they started getting into the trial and what have you. You you tend to, I mean, you could still watch it in a episode by episode basis, but you kind of want it. What happened? It's not like it is now where it's um, required television where you have to watch every single episode in order to get it. Yeah, true. They still have the previously on, but yeah, um, it, it was very rare. I, at most, uh, a team would have like to be continued, or they would have like a, a small arc, like a three or four episodes. You wouldn't have to go from the first episode to the last episode to understand everything that was going on. Right. And they also didn't have like the the freak of the week kind of. You know how they do with some sci-fi shows. Where they have a, an arc, but then all of a sudden they just dead stop, and you're like, these are just filler episodes to get to the end of the season. This is Why am I even wasting my time? Why make 22 episodes if you only have 18 episodes worth of story? Yeah. 
So, uh, the A team, of course, if most people don't know, um, is basically these four guys who were set up for a crime, uh, they didn't commit, they go on the run, and they go around the country basically helping the needy, people who are desperate, who are, uh, basically being, uh, bullied, and, uh, I'm trying to think of the right word, but, you know, it's where, like, corrupt towns, you know, it's like the walking tall kind of idea, where it's all being run by terrible people, and someone has to come in and change it. And that was the A team. Where they didn't have to live by the rules, yeah. per se. Yeah. Here's the weird <laughs> thing is, if you were after them, you know, it's always a forward and decker after the A team. And uh, <laughs> I can't do that guy's voice right, but I always loved him. No, I was really good, man. I was good. <laughs> <laughs> but he always did the voice for Airwolf. The opening narration, you're just like, yeah, that guy has an awesome voice. Um, I don't, know, I don't understand how it is that they never thought to do the same thing. I mean, every episode kind of had the same pattern. Like, uh, it'd be uh, George Papard in some sort of crazy costume and someone would find him performing at some show. And they're like, I need the help of the A-Team. Well, let me see if I can find them and I'll let them know. And uh, how is it the military wasn't like, hey, you guys noticed the last 80 episodes? <laughs> that uh, everybody just seems to walk up to him and ask for help. And that's how they find him. Why don't we do the same thing? <laughs> Because our government's just stupid. Anyway, yeah. we'll move on. <laughs> and that, that or they'd be like, you know what? You look like you're a military person. I can't exactly help you. Because um, it wasn't just uh, Hannibal that would do it. Face would do the costumes, too. That must have been fun for both of them to do that kind of uh, you know, oh, yeah. like character role stuff. Definitely. What, what was the name of the guy that was um, Face in the movie, you know, the pilot? Oh, you know what? Uh, I think it was Tim Dunnigan. He was in the Captain Power TV show, which if you look okay. at the Captain Power TV show, either the director had no idea how to use him or he was a terrible actor. So maybe it was a good idea to get rid of him. I, I, I kind of liked him. He did a, I mean, honestly, I like, I uh, wasn't Benedict better, but um, I think he had a, he had what it took, but I don't know. I, I just didn't know what happened there, why they got rid of him. or. Oh, it's, uh, well, A, it was because he was too young. They were supposed to be in Vietnam. And he, oh. while he was of the right age, he had a very youthful look. He didn't, right. he, he wasn't believable as someone who had been in the military, you know, 12 years earlier. Whereas Dirk Benedict kind of had like a rugged handsomeness to him that would help him, you know, that, that would be believable. Also the fact that this is rumor. Um, George Papard was jealous because he was so tall. He, it, it was uh, one of those ego things. I heard George Papard was real egotistical the whole time he was doing the show. That sounds about right. You know, the uh, George Papard's the only one that actually was a movie star. You know, for about 10, 15 years there, he was the lead in theatrical releases, and all of a sudden it just dries up. He has to go to television. That's not anything new. Lots of great actors, you know, do television. But for some reason, he was overly sensitive about it. He had trouble sharing the screen with, uh, you know, Mr. T wasn't even an actor, so he considered him out of his league. You know, he's always having to share the the part of the handsome lead with Dirk Benedict. And I, I heard he was absolutely god-awful to any women that showed up on the set. Yeah. Which is kind of a that's, bummer, that's, man. Those are the kind of things you don't want to read. You do. <laughs> yeah. <I laughs> kind know. of put the damper on things. You know who was considered before George Papard? I don't think I do, no. James Coburn. Really? Yeah, James Coburn was originally considered the lead, and uh, this is at a point where his career was kind of suffering, too. And I actually really like him, so I was curious to see what it would have been like, but alas, it did not happen. You're typing around I know I to see if I'm telling the truth. <laughs> I couldn't, I'm thinking, yeah, I was thinking of the wrong face. Okay. Yeah, he would have been perfect. <clears throat> Oh, man. Anyway. And coincidentally, coincidentally, James Coburn was in Magnificent Seven. And then if you go to the last season, Robert Vaughn, also in Magnificent Seven, was basically like the co-lead with George Papard. Okay. Now, now I've seen... I've only seen a handful of movies that he's been in, which is my own fault. I know there's... But anyway, not that I didn't want to. Uh, but I do know he's been in a handful of westerns that I've seen. Is that was that his staple or uh, which one? Um, James Coburn? No, no, no. Um... Oh, Robert Vaughn. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh man, name skipping my head. Slappy McGee, Scooter McVille, uh, 
sandwich in Hamilton in the middle of them? <laughs> Who are you thinking of? George Papard. Why did his name just skip my head? Holy crap. That is crap. ridiculous. I just said George Papard like 12 times. This is I know. It is, it, I know. I'm the one who just woke up. <laughs> I haven't had my cucumbers yet. Anyway. All right. Um, <laughs> no, George Papard is mostly known for um, Breakfast at Tiffany's, and then he did just a bunch of like right. war movies, and then when war movies were no longer popular, he would do cop movies. I believe uh, right before he did A-Team, he was in Damnation Alley, with uh, Jan Michael Vincent, which is um, an interesting sci-fi movie with incredibly bad effects. Hmm, Jan Michael Vincent. Jan That's Michael an interesting. Airwolf. Movie. Yeah, I don't know. Those two. Uh, one's a, a notorious drunk with anger issues, and George Papard, uh, oh, egotistical, rude man. So it must not have gone well. <laughs> oh, that would have been a recipe for disaster. Anyway. Now, did you watch the movie? I'm assuming you did. Yeah, I think I actually went to the theater to see that. So did I. Uh, what did you think of it? <laughs> um, I liked it to be honest. If it was, you know, if it could stand on its own, but coming from the original, there were certain things I didn't like about it. I couldn't put a finger on them right now, but um, I won't go all out and say I don't. I hate it or anything, but. I'd watch it again. How yeah. about that? <laughs> there are two things that I had, uh, I had problems with. Uh, the fact that Liam Neeson was forced to say uh, he, uh, the plan thing. It's almost as if he had an OCD thing with it. Right. Because it's like every five minutes, he's like, I love when a plan comes together. The plan. you got to put a, get a plan together. The idea behind this is the plan. You're like, oh, my God. Does he have issues? Should he be in a mental institution? <laughs> yeah. He's OCD, definitely. All right. And, uh, and the end is... Um, it works well. The action sequences are really tight until the very end, and it's just like CGI overboard. You know, it's just like one of these things where it's just drowning in its own special effects. And I was just like, man, it could have gone so much better if they had just let it go. Yeah. You know, just tried to cut the... I mean, that's another thing. If they had cut the budget, you know, if the, the ending hadn't been so big, there might have been a sequel. That thing cost a fortune. It was like $110 million, and I believe it only brought in about 80 in America. They talked about the fact that it did so well in video that they were going to do a sequel, but obviously that hasn't happened. I think they should do, if they're going to bring it back, bring it back as a TV show. No stars, just good actors, you know, like you know, like character actors. Just bring in some guys who aren't A-listers, big budget kind of guys. Well, just, I'd be interested to see what they could do in modern time after after five seasons i wonder what they could do now to make it different yeah i mean you can't bring back the original cast because they're starting to look pretty rough um, right but if you found well you know what if they formed a new team a, a team of youngsters to take over what if they were still the guys in the office you know maybe yeah, i bet you mr t could still drive the van and put stuff together you know oh, yeah i mean but for the most part the action has changed too you can't just go in mowing people down with machine guns even though it, I don't think they ever actually killed anybody, did they? Did you ever see nobody nope. die? Nobody ever died, which, you know, <laughs> really, they must have been awesome shots. No kidding. Um, so you could have them basically running a new team, uh, but the action has changed. You can't just simply punch people and just open fire. So you'd get guys that were like snipers or, um, you know, more precise. And, you know, kung fu experts, you throw some parkour in there, maybe some bow and arrows, because everybody loves bow and arrows now. You know, it's not, it would actually have to change, but you could still have the core team, the original team, be in charge. You do some freestyle walking. <laughs> you know, oh, I'm sorry. let's talk about the cast real quick. Uh, Dirk Benedict, we talked <clears> about George <throat> Papard already, but Dirk Benedict had just come off of Battlestar Galactica, um, a cult hit, but at the time it was so expensive they couldn't afford to keep it on the air. But um, he was fantastic in that show. And it's great that he actually got a second opportunity to be a star because you never know. Sometimes these guys show up in these 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 uh, cult favorites and you never hear from them again. Yeah, that would have been unfortunate. Yeah, and uh, I think he's the most likable of the cast. Um, you know, I think he's the one that women would tune in for. And, uh, you know, from a comedic sense, uh, he played well off of everybody. I was going to say, I like Murdoch, but yeah, the women... Yeah. <laughs> now, I'll say this about Murdoch. Dwight Schultz is the true actor of the bunch. Um, yes. 
You know, George is the lead, Dirk Benedict is the good looks, Mr. T is the brawn, and he was a celebrity by that time anyway because of Rocky Three. Dwight Schultz is the one who was a nobody, who had to come in and basically <clears throat> work his butt off in order to shine uh, when compared to the other three. And he did an amazing job. And in fact, he it's a shame that he is one of those actors that a lot of people don't know his name. They recognize his face, and when he shows up on stuff, they're like, oh yeah, I like that guy. But He's Murdoch. Uh, <laughs> he was he was like um like a really well trained actor who just did exactly what he needed to do and in order to um make Murdoch just not not look just like a lunatic who threw out uh you know funny lines here and there um it takes a good actor to uh, put in some empathy and some true humanity into a character like that right right do you remember when he was on Star Trek the Next Generation I was just gonna mention that yeah it's when I saw him on there I'm like Murdoch yeah, it's, a, it's, it's, it's my favorite episode. You're so used to seeing him with that hat on, you know, and acting crazy. It took me a couple episodes going, man, I know he is familiar, but where do I know him from? Mind you, I was 10 at the time. I didn't have IMDb to look things up. Right, right. But he's also done the uh, a voice. Well, he does a bunch of voiceover works, I'm, I'm guessing. But uh, one in particular that strikes my interest is Arkham Knight. Oh, yeah, the new one. The new movie. Is it out yet? Oh, wait, um, Arkham Knight's the game, isn't it? Like the video game, yeah. Oh, all right, all right, all right. That's, that's the latest video game. Uh, Does it say what character he plays? I have not, yeah, uh, I have it somewhere. Was it? Two voices, Laszlo Valentin, Professor Pig, or maybe they're one and the same, I don't know. Yeah, but... I have no idea who those are. <laughs> I was hoping Scarecrow or something. <laughs> I don't know, it would have been awesome. But, uh, you uh, not that he couldn't do it. He's an awesome character actor, if you will, with, with different voices and what have you. So, but, uh, I, yeah. Uh, so, um, Go on. the ratings for the show dropped dramatically. It started off real strong, uh, you know, in the top ten for the first three seasons. And I can't find any reason why season four plummeted so fast. I can't seem to find the competition that it was up against. Um, maybe people just got tired of the formula, you know, by season four, it is basically the same setup and payoff every single week. Right. But uh, season five, I actually found quite interesting. It's not a full season. It's only um, 13 episodes, but they change it by the fact that they have finally captured and then they give them the opportunity to work off their crime, which they never did commit in the first place. But they work it off like in the way um, Magnificent Seven, or not Magnificent Seven, Dirty Dozen. You know, they go into this crazy... Uh, uh, missions, and if they come out alive and complete everything, they, they are free men. They're uh, cleared. And I thought that was a really good idea. It just, for some reason, I think the budget was too low to really get the idea across. Did you say a minute ago that Robert Vaughn was up for Hannibal? No, Robert Vaughn, I was just mentioning uh, the, the connection between him and James Coburn. Oh, that's right. Okay. I thought that would have been an interesting tidbit, but okay, moving on. And, uh, of course, there was there were a couple women that were in the show, but um, I always felt like they didn't really know how to use them properly. Um, I think maybe it was just, uh, oh, just to get women to watch the show. But um, it right. would have been nice. If they do the show now, you know, obviously we're at a point where we can just have a woman on the team kicking butt. And uh, instead right. of just being the pretty person that stands around like just uh, gives them a mission or is there a connection to the person who needs help. And... Um, I would like to see that. If they bring the show back, uh, add a woman to it as, you know, a kick butt like uh, martial artist or something. I don't understand why they couldn't have done that back then either. I mean, they had plenty of shows with strong female leads. Yeah. But... Um, I don't know. Maybe it's because of the boys club or maybe the audience for A Team was primarily young boys. We don't want to see girls. That's not true because we all watched Wonder Woman. Mind you, I have to give you the fact that uh -huh. she had that costume. But, uh, you know, we had Charlie's Angels. Maybe, maybe it was the fact that Stephen J. Uh, here's the thing. If you look at a lot of the women who were kicking butt back then, most of them were part of the jiggle factor. Not all of them were like police woman where she was a strong, you know, confident lead who didn't have to show off her chest and wear tight costumes. Uh, Charlie's Angels and Wonder Woman, you know, a lot of it's the boobage factor, and uh, it kind of changed things. All right, so we pretty much got to the end of what the show was all about, the cast, and what could go right with it. Now let's talk about our favorite part of the show. What was the van made out of? Metal. I know, but you know, like, what were its guts? <laughs> what were the power behind it? 
<clears throat> I've got some interesting tidbits on the van. One one particular thing is I hold before me right now one of my pride and joys because I collect Hot Wheels. And I have the 18 van. And I'm looking at it thinking it's right, right? Yeah. It's all black. Where's the stripe? And I've noticed, like, tell us, where, no, 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 the stripe's there. Oh. The red wheels, the, the fin and everything, but it's all black. When in reality, the van itself was actually a two-tone color. Really? Like, a lot of the toys they released were all black. Never understood that. Was it too expensive? Yeah, the van's actually two colors. I don't know. <laughs> they couldn't dip the top in. I don't know. <laughs> To be fair, it was a dark gray, dark metallic gray. It looked really close to the black, but <clears throat> anyway. Anywho, moving on. I got a question to ask you. you. Go ahead. If you had to guess what platform the prior GM van was built on, what would you say? The frame, the platform, the chassis, everything underneath it. I, nothing. I got nothing here. Like the Mustang was built off the of Paramount. You got nothing. The Corvair. What? That doesn't even make sense. Yeah. But no, not this van. The van prior to the van that this replaced, That's I'm leading into it. Anyway. Okay, okay. <clears throat> I just thought that was interesting to, to lead on. It was essentially that their Corvair vans were essentially the equivalent of VW Microbus. Okay. It was that tiny little engine mounted just like the Corvair was. But anyway, moving on. <clears throat> <laughs> the van itself was a 1983 G-Series um, van. Uh, I'm gonna have to read something here verbatim because it's really easier to say it that way, and they'll get all the information in one little shot here. So I'm gonna read through it really fast. The van is an '83 G Series customized by Universal Studios prop department. Uh, I can never find the guy who actually made it, and I'm sure it's out there somewhere. But uh, the guy who designed or whatever. But anyway, maybe it's a conglomeration of them. But uh, the engine was a 350 cubic inch. I uh, had some minor modifications done with the carburetor and the exhaust system. The wheels are 15-inch painted black with red accents. Um, of course, I had the brush guard on the wing and the red stripe. And I'm going to stop reading verbatim because there's a lot here. So, <laughs> But I'm going to move on down to this spot here where it says <clears throat> uh, the scenes where they did the burnouts, they were done by spraying bleach in front of it to help it. It helps it do it, and when you burn bleach, it just makes this big, massive cloud of smoke. Uh, It goes on to say that the van itself needed that help because it wasn't that powerful. That is a letdown. (laughs) I'm thinking it would be a practice. You'd think this van would be, you know, monster, but it's not. But it did have a 350 engine in it, which is very common for a lot of the... uh, and they were in various iterations, but I cannot find the actual specs on what engine, what version engine they had in there, other than uh, it was also, well, no, that was, that was, that was, it was the same engine that was offered in the 67 Camaro. The first time it was ever offered was in a 67 Camaro. Um, that's about all I can give on the van, unfortunately. You'd think there'd be a lot more information yeah. out there, and if there is, I'd love to hear from you guys. You got something? No, no, that was it. Um, you know, cars are not you my there? forte. My, mine is more. Oh, than... <laughs> what? I thought I'd lost you for a second there. <laughs> I lost you too, buddy. Yeah, anyway, we can move on. Uh, um, so yeah, the A team. Uh... <laughs> Don't go. <laughs> Earlier, when you said moving on, I blew a snot bubble. I have to admit, I just. <laughs> oh man! Like, I, I didn't. Mean I didn't to. need that. <laughs> I just was laughing so hard that it just kind of went bloop. <laughs> All right, everybody, so let's end with the A-Team, our next show. Now, this is normally the part where I play the theme song for the next show, and frankly, it seems kind of silly now. Um, the next show we're going to discuss is Stingray, which um, is kind of a cult show. Not a lot of people remember this show, and when it first premiered, it was actually a pretty decent-sized hit, but time and you know competition pretty much killed it off. You can find the complete series on DVD, just like the way you can find the complete series of the A-Team on DVD, and um, I believe I picked up the whole series of Stingray for about seven ninety nine. It's from uh, Mill Creek Entertainment, so it's a really good buy. You get twenty five episodes for dirt cheap. And uh, what did you think of the show, Ron? I loved it. I wish I'd have known about it when it was 
when it was out. You know? Yeah, well, we were pretty young. <clears throat> I don't know how I missed it. Yeah, I mean, we were, what, you were only, what, eight, and I was seven when the show premiered? So you can't really, it's, you know, that it's kind of a mature show. I think it aired at 10 o'clock at night, like, uh, because of the violence at the time. Oh, it was so well, extreme, right. so, <laughs> at the time. I mean, now it seems like nothing. But um, to give you a general idea of what the show is, uh, basically, it kind of takes the concept of the A-Team, where it's people on the run or kind of hiding out. <laughs> and, what's that? Ron, what'd you say? I didn't say anything. Oh. Uh, it's basically takes the idea of guys who are on the run, they're hiding, they're kind of mysterious characters, and people come to them for help. And he kind of just does it, you know, he uses costumes, he uses all sorts of, like, little tricks and tricks. He wasn't as action-oriented, you know, not all about the guns and the, you know, the MacGyver themes. Oh, yeah, what's one thing we didn't discuss in A-Team is the MacGyverisms. That almost started with the A-Team, where they would just take something and just slap on all the stuff to make a new... Uh, weapon or a new vehicle that was kind of something that started there but MacGyver definitely took it to the the ultimate degree it's too bad MacGyver didn't have a cool car because then we could discuss that on a show but that's not gonna happen yeah yeah so the uh, the stingray character which you never really know his name he just goes by Ray sometimes is uh he was more like a kung fu guy. At best, he'd use a small gun. He wasn't really a violent, violent guy. You know, he, I don't think his goal was to kill people. And uh, that was kind of a cool thing. It was an R-rated show, and there was violence. But for some reason, he didn't seem to be all um, murder crazy like some action stars seem to be. Right. I don't want to say murder, but you know, like in Miami Vice, it seemed like they were killing somebody every single episode. And that didn't seem to be really the point of Stingray. Let's say... I am just wondering, did you ever figure out what what made him do what he's doing? No, I think the show the show was I think planning on revealing that, but it just never happened. It got canceled um, at the end of the second season, and it never came around. They kept dropping little bits and pieces, and here's what I think happened: the violence of Vietnam was so terrible for him. I think he was like a special missions kind of person. Uh, he right. seemed, it almost has a slight sci-fi bent to it, to the fact that he seems to be enhanced. Um, I'm only I'm only reading into this. It's kind of like that show, The Sentinel. Do you remember The Sentinel? It was on for like five years, where the guy yes. had, he had like heightened hearing, um, smells. You know, every his five senses were all heightened, and it seems that way with Stingray because he um, his memory was uh, absolutely in, insane. He could adopt any sort of language. And an accent, and he could master any sort of equipment. It's like he was beyond. He was more human than human. And I get the feeling that these missions that he went on in Vietnam did serious damage. And when he came back, he kind of disappeared. And then he found that his skills could be used to help people who didn't have, like, the finances or the manpower. And uh, that was kind of his mission. But I don't know if the government really wanted to let him go. Or if he was like an experimental human, um, was he allowed at all? Was he basically considered property of the government? That's why he goes undercover. Why he isn't, uh, you know, he doesn't go by a real name. He's always on the move. That that's one thing that I was always curious about. That sounds right. I don't know. Or works. Yeah, I mean, they don't really answer it. At the same time, there's some government people who seem to be connected to him that don't have a problem. Like they don't want to capture him. It it's. I don't know. It's kind of strange. It's also kind of like the airwolf method. It's like, well, we have better use of him. If we need him, just let him go. Just let him be at peace. And if he decides to help us, he helps us. If he doesn't, he doesn't. Capturing him is only going to make things worse because then he's completely useless. <laughs> now, this is another show that had a great theme by Mike Post. It seemed like almost like 50% of the shows in the 80s had a theme song by him. You know, Hill Street Blues, Stingray. A team, anything uh, really awesome and catchy seemed to be written by him. I sure hope he wrote in every contract that he gets royalties every time it's played. You know, that's actually uh, <laughs> was a common thing back then. Did you know that Alan Thicke wrote a crap ton of theme songs, and every time it plays or it's sold, he gets a check. That's awesome. Yeah, I didn't know that, but uh, like I'm watching, uh, I was watching Facts of Life the other day, and I see in the credits that Alan Thicke wrote it. And then I was listening to an interview with him on the Gilbert Godfrey show. And uh, he was like, oh, yeah, I just, that's what I primarily did before I became an actor was just write theme songs. And I was like, that's crazy. I had no idea. I wish I, I, wish I had that kind of talent. Yeah. 
and of course, obviously, the music part went over to his son, and uh, he still acts right. occasionally, but uh, he's not really. I don't think he's pursuing any like regular parts. But I like Alan Thicke. Uh, the actor that stars in Stingray is kind of like um, an actor's actor. He was a star for maybe ten minutes. Uh, his name is Nick Mancuso. Uh, he's just one of those character actors. He had a big lead in this horror movie called Nightwing that Warner Brothers thought was going to be huge. It didn't really connect. He did a couple movies like with Charlton Heston and stuff like that. But then he found himself um, as a critically acclaimed actor but not popular actor. And he was given the opportunity to do a TV show with Stephen J. Cannell, also the co-creator of uh, The A-Team. And uh, he says, I'll do it, but I'm Canadian. And I want to bring the money up, you know, the shooting money, the production costs, up to where I live to help that, you know, Vancouver was a growing film market. So not only right. did he help his people, he could stay home. He's almost primarily done stuff only in Canada. And um, the stuff he didn't do in Canada that I know, I know off the top of my head that you might recognize is uh, he was in, he's the main villain in Rapid Fire with Brandon Lee. Do you remember that movie? That's another, I was trying to figure out movies I'd seen him in before and I didn't see that one, but yes, uh, I have seen that one. Uh, he is in Under Siege 1 and 2, and then it kind of just tapers off from there. He would do character stuff. He did a really great TV show after this called, uh, I want to say it's called Matrix. Um, oddly enough, with uh, the girl who was Trinity in Matrix, um, Carrie Ann Moss. Uh, yeah. I, I think it was just like a, a slight sci-fi action show. Uh, Stingray, like I said, only lasted 25 uh, episodes, two seasons. There was a point in time where Stephen J. Cannell came to Nick Mancuso and said, hey, your show is still doing well internationally, and we've been syndicating it to some markets. Do you want to continue the show? And he's like, I'm very interested. I love playing the character. And this is in 1989, so it's a couple years after the show was canceled. But when right. he saw how much the budget was going to be, he's like, how can we afford good writers? How can we do decent action and bring in some good guest stars at this cost? And he said, as much as I wanted to do it, I just couldn't see it being worth it. Like, I didn't want to ruin the legacy, even though it was short-lived, the legacy of the first two seasons by bringing in a third season that was garbage. Kind of like the way the... Well, Go ahead. I said, that's awesome. That means he's put, he's taking some pride in it, you know what I mean? Yeah, he could have easily taken a paycheck and, and moved on, but he didn't. Uh, there's uh, another show. Stephen J. Cannell did an insane amount of TV shows from, like, 1978 to 80, uh, 95. If you look at 21 Jump Street, there were four seasons that were pretty top-notch. I mean, yes, every season has episodes that don't work. But he wanted to pad the fifth season after Fox canceled the show. And um, so basically the fifth season is just Holly Robinson, Peter DeLuise for about six episodes, and Steve Williams as a captain. And then a whole bunch of new characters that you didn't know that weren't very good. And the budget, I believe, was four hundred thousand dollars an episode, when usually it was nearly a million. And the right, all the, almost all the writers were fired. Of course, most of the cast left, and he just wanted to pad it to get to a hundred episodes so he could syndicate it. And at that point, you're just like, really? Did you really need to do it? Why couldn't you just let the show live the way it was instead of just making that last season so painful? Ugh. There's shows like no, that that I, they, they either change it so much to try to find a new audience or they uh, cut the costs. Like, what is it, Battlestar 1980, the one where they're on the motorcycles? That, yeah. Oh, that was a way to keep the franchise alive, but it just wasn't very good. Oh. I'll say, wanted to mention, this kind of led me uh, back on a road of uh, nostalgia, I guess. But uh, he was in an episode of Erie, Indiana, The Other Dimension. Oh, you know, I never saw that one. That When they brought it back because it was doing so well internationally. Yeah, I didn't get to see The Other Dimension. Honestly, I didn't even know about it. But the original I watched and loved, um, it sadly, that didn't take off. Because I think they only made 19 episodes of it, but just thought I'd throw that in there. Yeah, we watched that. You and I, I think that's what we bonded on. Was, yeah. Um, yeah. I remember correctly, we were talking... We were playing handball or something in gym. The very first time we ever met was in gym class. We're talking. We're playing handball, but the whole time I think we talked about like what we were into, like music and movies and TV shows. And I seem to recall having a conversation with you about how much we both loved uh, the episode of Indiana, Indiana. I think that just aired was the one with Matt Frewer, where he's in like the little um, capsule that would let him ride inside tornadoes. 
That's awesome. I, I can't remember I, that one. Yeah, I don't <laughs> know if you remember that conversation. Yeah, but I remember us talking about that. And we're like, that was such a good episode. It's such a weird and creepy show. Why don't they have more stuff on TV like that? And little did we know, just right around the corner was X Files, and that would start a whole new, um, like genre of like mysterious investigations of you know weird happenings. I loved X Files. There was yeah. another show he was in, or not show, a movie he was in called. <laughs> and this brought back memories. Let me tell you, Against the Law. Which with Richard Grieco. Richard Grieco. Was put on ninety seven. With Richard Grieco. Richard. He plays this. Oh man, I can't remember the exact details of it, but he's essentially a gunslinger or whatever. I don't know if he was an actor and was really good at it or whatever. I don't know, but um, I could just be pulling crap out of my butt there. But anyway, <laughs> <laughs> I just briefly looked at a, a trailer to see if I had actually seen that movie because it sounded familiar, and I, I have. Um, I have not. I didn't even know what this movie was. But I'm thinking about. Before. What brought back old memories was Greco and all the <laughs> some of the stuff we watched in the anyway. But... <laughs> did uh did you see um uh, what Richard Greco looks like now? He looks cadaverous. Everybody from Twenty One Jump Street looks amazing, except for him. Yeah. He looks like uh, someone sucked this the, all the moisture out of his body, and he's just like <laughs> <laughs> zombie. Yeah, it looks bad. It's rough. Oh, man. All right. And um, uh, what are the details on the car in Stingray? Oh, I've got some good details on this one. When it comes to the Corvette, <clears throat> my brother-in-law, he's got a 1990. And I love the car, but I'll leave it to him. I've always been a Mustang guy. But I love vets like everyone else. But when it comes to if I had to choose which one I wanted or which style I would want, this would be it. And it's just, to me, it's the epitome of monster V8s. You know what I mean? It's just uh, adrenaline rushing, uh, visceral, you know what I mean? Yeah. Anyway, um, this, uh, let's see, in 65, it was the first year they put the big block, uh, I put a big block in it, or I don't know if it was the first year of the big block or just the first year they put one in the Corvette, but it was a 6.5 liter V8 with 396 cubic inches, put out 425 horsepower at 410 foot pounds of torque, of uh, face melting torque. Anyway, um, <laughs> it had uh, the car also had an option for a 327 fuel injected engine, but this is where it's kind of interesting. It makes you wonder where what's going on in the minds of the engineers or, or the powers that be. But uh, the fuel injected engine had 375 horsepower compared to the 425 in the, the big block. Uh, what's it say? And at $245 in 1965 money, buyers, they really couldn't justify buying it, right? There's only, I mean, $245 different, dollars difference and you get less horsepower. Yeah. And like, Compared in today's money, that's about eighteen hundred dollars oh. difference. Yeah. You know anyway, that essentially that. marked the death of the fuel injection engine in the Corvette for eighteen years. It would take eighteen years before they bring another fuel injected back into the uh, into it. Oh, shame. It was also the first time that they saw they put four wheel disc brakes in it. Uh, what does it say? Um, there was something I was leading. To, oh, the vet from the eighteen. Um, this is a 425 horse, right? Mm -hmm. Even the, the, uh, small block option was a, uh, 350 horse. The V8, let's see, where is it? 200 horse. It was the only option available in the Corvette in 1984. It was 200 horse. Wow. <laughs> Pretty lame compared to 425. Yeah, that's a big drop. <laughs> but anyway. You know, um, you know what's weird about this? Uh, I just realized these are both shows about guys that are kind of hidden on the run, and yet they uh -huh. had such iconic vehicles. Flash cars. <laughs> <laughs> it's not like they had a generic. It's not like they were riding around in a Gremlin or a Ford Festiva. Um, by the way, everybody, if you've been listening to every single episode, um, it's like a drinking game. If I bring up the Ford Festiva, just take a drink. At least once per episode, I bring that up because it's the funniest thing for me to say. I love saying Ford Festiva. you got to say souped up Ford Festiva. Yeah, souped up. I forgot that's the part. 
Oh, I don't even know where we got that from. I think it was from uh, Bob and Tom when we were kids. <laughs> I think so. <laughs> Um, but, it, but yeah, it doesn't think it's, it seems kind of strange that new generic vehicles they very recognizable, unique vehicles, and someone's like, "Hey, that's just like the vehicle the A team rides around in." Oh, are, are we calling them the A team? What? Those four guys that were always hunting, we're calling them the A team now. I, I, I guess it, it, is that not cool? Yeah, yeah. But uh, you're right. That vehicle, you don't see a whole lot like them. That's odd. You know, the A team <laughs> was in town just last night. What are the chances? Oh, wait. Hold on. Let's go get them. <laughs> <laughs> too late <clears throat> oh dang it. i was just thinking about that the other day i, I can't remember what show it was i'll have to think about that but anywho did i ruin your train of thought Are you, were you done with the vehicle or was my uh no, 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 need no. For <laughs> dorky trivia i could say uh dorky trivia no yeah. you're fine I love dorky trivia. <laughs> okay, I think so the only other thing I had to offer was that that 350 horsepower motor that they offered was a small block, was also an option, and that was the first time they they because it was smaller, yeah. they could actually power steering in it. Could you imagine not having power steering? That yeah, God but, yes. <laughs> I, okay, I've actually. Do you remember the time that we were driving up a hill? We were on the highway. We we're coming up, and my uh, gas ran out. Ran out, we got to the very top of the hill, and we kind of just rolled the whole way to the gas station. But as we got to the gas station, I could not turn because ah, I had power steering. And we were all, <laughs> all three of us in that truck were pulling on the steering wheel, trying to get it into the right spot so I can get some gas, and it died. Just Everything just killed the second we hit that spot. And I was like, what were the chances? What if we were going up the hill and it happened, and we would have been so screwed? <laughs> So yes, power steering is wonderful. The manual steering is so bad if you're moving. <laughs> yeah, we but were. when you're moving at t two mile an hour, it, it sucks. <laughs> uh, all right, so uh, I believe we're done with Stingray. Is there anything else you want to say about the show? No, no. I, I'm definitely going to be watching the rest of them. Yeah, the third show and our final of the uh, this episode will discuss uh, the Highwayman. Like I said before, we kind of touched upon this when we were talking about Dukes of Hazard. It wasn't planned; it just came out of conversation. But now we've both had the chance to actually watch the show. I've seen it before, and um, it had been about eh, 12 years since I caught some bootlegs. But like I said, uh, if you're not going to make them available to the public, we got to find them somehow. We got to keep the show alive in one way or another. What did you think of the Highwayman? Westerns, I loved it. <laughs> it had, I don't know, eventually it got into, uh, at the beginning when he's coming up and along, you know, when we first introduced to the guy, I was thinking kind of sci-fi like or whatever, but then it immediately moved into a Western feel and I loved it. Yeah, it's weird. It's like it's, a modern day Western. It's a modern day Western with Mad Max tone, uh, but also the fact it has like yes. kind of that Knight Rider feel where it's like slightly futuristic. Yeah. But not a post-apocalyptic future. It's, 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 a, it's a weird amalgam of certain things. Now, I really like the movie. Now, right. to give people an idea what the plot is, it's another one of those mysterious guys who goes from town to town to help people. Um, this was kind of towards the end of that that, um, that that mini genre of guys with cool vehicles that were kind of just roaming from town to town. And this time he works for a government agency that's like real top secret. And uh, so he's not on the run like the other shows. And he basically has this uh, semi, <laughs> the biggest semi you've ever seen in your life, that also has a couple secrets in it. Right. What are those secrets, Ron? <clears throat> oh, couple secrets. Okay, I know of one in particular. Oh, did you get past the pilot movie? No. Oh, okay. The show continues. No. More vehicles were added as the show would go on. Oh, uh, okay. No, I've I did read on about um, like another highwayman, if you will, had his vehicle and it had like a car or truck or something in it. I don't know what it is exactly, but <clears throat> excuse me. But um, his particular the the highwayman's uh, vehicle concealed in the bullet shaped nose of the truck. Th this is what caught me it uh, made me kind of like snicker a little bit in the movie yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> like okay it, it how's the surprise and i and i wrote this on purpose albeit a slow one. Oh my god it <laughs> take forever 
But our patience, you know, our patience like, 30 years ago was totally different. We would just sit there and wait. Like, um, I was watching The Howling, and uh, it's the same special effects they use in Manimal, if anybody's seen Manimal. Yeah. It's where um, basically yeah. the, the air bladder effects, and you see everything stretch, and it takes like 10 minutes. But we're absorbed by it because we've never seen anything like it. Now it's CGI, they change in two seconds, and we're done. But like you said, this this transformation from the helicopter popping out of the the semi takes forever. Yes, and all the freaking cops are laying out to just what is going on? Their jaws are on the ground, going, "Should we shoot or should we just wait?" <laughs> Let's just watch it all. Oh. Like, like rotors coming up out of the top. Maybe we should do something. No, let's watch it. Let's make sure. <laughs> Yeah, so a helicopter pops out of the top, but as the show progressed, if I remember correctly, um, I only just rewatched the the pilot movie, but I've seen the whole series. I'm pretty sure um, as the show changed, there was a car that was added to the back of the semi, and I believe a motorcycle was also added. So they're just like touching every. I mean, next thing, if it made it to season two, there'd be skateboards and maybe a razor scooter, maybe some rollerblades, <laughs> a boogie board. <laughs> Heelys? Yeah. Oh, yeah, no. he would get desperate and pop them out of his... <laughs> the show changed dramatically. Well, you know, the cops have moved that slow. It's not that big a deal. Yeah. The show changed dramatically from the movie to the show. The Are you movie, still there? The movie is actually really high budget. I really enjoyed the cast. It was like a who's who of, hey, that guy always plays a bad guy in A-Team, and that guy always plays a bad guy in The Fall Guy. It's like every great villain and stuntman was brought in for this movie. Rowdy, Roddy, Piper. Wings Hauser. Uh, Branscone Richmond from uh, Renegade. And the, it just never stops. Jimmy Smits. Yes. Wow, there is a massive delay between you and I now. That is annoying. I'll just sing songs between the breaks. <laughs> All right. Are you paused? No, we're live. We're going live. It's just there's a delay. We are live. We're live. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, so what, so, I have to count two seconds? <laughs> yeah, I'll just sing a song and, and then just to kind of do a little jazz beat while I wait. Um, so, yeah, the cast was huge for that first movie. The budget, there's lots of action, um, lots of locations. And then when the show came back, they, um, they cut the DJ girl, you know, the one who's doing, like, the broadcasting from wherever. Uh, they fired her. Mm -hmm. um, they gave him a partner in Jocko. Do you remember Jocko? No. Jocko, I'm not talking about Michael Jackson. Jocko, for a very, very short period of time, everybody was crazy about him because uh, we had just come off of the success of Crocodile Dundee. So all of a sudden, we were really interested in what's going on with Australians. And he did battery commercials where he would go, Oi! And that was pretty much it. I guess he was a soccer player, and then he just started becoming a battery pitch man. Huh. Yeah, and he was no, a star of the no, show. It's probably no one's place. <laughs> well, you got to start somewhere. <laughs> and, of course, you mentioned in the last time we talked about this, the opening theme is narrated by none other than... Another... Oh, shoot. Yeah, I, I, I wrote... I, yeah. <laughs> oh, you forgot. William Conrad. William Conrad, my favorite, from Gunsmoke. All right, awesome. so that's what... Nick, yeah. That made it even more Western feel for me. That that part right there is, was awesome. Yeah, if you don't know who William Conrad is, he starred in Canon, uh, which was a detective show in the '70s, and then he started like a mystery show um, in the early, I want to say late '80s, early '90s, called Jake and the Fat Man. Mhm. Mm yeah. And uh, they, I don't know if I cut. Also. No, no, you're fine. He's also a Gunsmoke thing. Yeah, yeah. Okay. I heard, I heard all that. Okay. So the cool part is this was um, also the end of the whole awesome car trend that would get it would, would kind of lay down for a few years to get revived with Viper, but there was um, I guess it just kind of exhausted that kind of genre. You know, Airwolf was dying off, A Team was gone, Knight Rider was gone, 
So it's like Glenn A. Larson was going, you know what, this is our last shot. Let's make everything about this vehicle the coolest vehicle ever. Let's throw in like the Knight Rider panel boards and let's give it a helicopter and give it a motorcycle and give it this futuristic look. And they gave him this gun that looked like a normal shotgun, but it was more like a rocket launcher. <laughs> Uh, for a, a young boy, at the time I saw this show, this was like the greatest thing ever. Yes. You only get one shot with me. Sorry. <laughs> um, I really like Sam Jones. Sam Jones is very, very good in this role. He's likable. He's tough. He's sardonic. This seems like the perfect role for him. And yet, somehow, he never really became a star. Flash! Oh! <laughs> I totally did not make the connection. I don't know why. Maybe I'm losing it in my old age. But anyway. Well, he does look quite different. He doesn't have the long dyed hair. Not the blonde. Uh, his persona is uh, quite different. This one, he seems slightly disconnected, like kind of like separate from everything, where he's just kind of looking at it with amusement instead of being solely like, oh, everything's resting right. on my shoulders. Um, yeah, I just, uh, I just feel like the show had a lot of potential, and they kind of blew it with the, the series because... Uh, they changed the cast, the scripts were weaker, and um, I feel like some of the scripts, I believe, were reused from other shows. Like, uh, this is the A-Team script that wasn't good enough, you know, for the so we'll just patch it up and make it a Highwayman script. I don't know, it seemed like it had a lot of potential as maybe a movie series, but then they just, it just got cheap and dull. Yeah, I, I didn't get a chance to see the, uh, or find, rather, the episodes, unfortunately. I'll get them to you. Uh, how many episodes did they do after that? Only eight. Okay. So it was eight. pretty short. Like, yeah. you kind of consider, it like, seems like something series. I would have... It seems like something I would have definitely have kept up with. But it had a... All right, everybody. I believe our connection is getting pretty terrible. Um, so just to let you know... Uh, you can catch every episode of Full Throttle TV up on Retro Rocket Entertainment. We have a Facebook page for that. Um, you can sign up on iTunes, Libsyn, uh, Stitcher, pretty much any sort of podcast app. We are on it. Let us know if you want us to cover any other shows that haven't already been covered. Uh, if you have any suggestions or comments about the show, go ahead and send us a message on our Facebook page. And um, this is Michael signing off. And I'm just going to go ahead. Oh, wait. Hey, Ron's coming back. Let's see. Hey, Ron. Hello. Hey, so I was just kind of telling them uh, to check us out on Facebook, you know, under Retro Rocket Entertainment. Uh, the artwork is done by Ron, which is awesome. He does the artwork for Full Throttle TV as well. If you like his art, let him know. Maybe you, you can hire him. Maybe he's available. If you're desperate in need, you can find the Ron team. <laughs> so this is where I laugh, right? Okay. Yes, this is where you laugh. Ha, 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 ha. All right, and um, so I just signed off. Ron, did you have anything else you want to say before we go? No, I'm good. Uh, well, I suppose I should. Let's see. Um, the Aerospatial Gazelle was the helicopter. I didn't throw that name in there. Oh, yeah. Uh, it's the same helicopter. If you, if any of you have been listening to us uh, from the beginning, uh, we did a, an episode on Blue Thunder and Airwolf and all that. Well, Blue Thunder was also the same kind of uh, airplane, or excuse me, helicopter. Well, that makes so sense. If you, want, Reusing, the, you reuse what's already made instead of having to build a new one, which is cool. Uh, I don't know if it's the same one or not, but uh, they were very popular at, uh, for using in movies and what have you. Oh, so okay. I don't know if it's because okay. it was cheap or what. But anyway, it looked cool. <laughs> anyway, that's all I had. Okay, sorry about that, everybody. I forgot the main point of the show is also to throw in the details of the vehicles. And we oh, got so fine. distracted with being cut off that I, I kind of sped things up. Was there anything about the truck? <laughs> Oh uh, yeah! Oh yeah! Um, nothing. Oh yeah! Inter interesting tidbit. It was an eighty uh, nineteen eighty Kenworth cab over. Um, that's all the information I can find out. But it cost the studio two hundred eighty seven thousand dollars to build this rig. Holy smokes! That's crazy. And the interesting tidbit is, it was bought by a company called the Highwayman Inc. And you can find them at the same name dot com, Highwayman Inc. dot com. Um, we're not getting paid for that, by the way. So. Could, <laughs> but, we, could but, we get paid for this? Hey, guys. That would, that would awesome. But they, they bought the truck, and they are um, restoring it and retrofitting it as a mobile tattoo parlor. Oh, that's unusual. Interesting, cool. Interesting and odd, but still the, the fact that the truck's going to be alive, and I'm sure they're going to use it for other things, but you know what I mean. But yeah. I thought that was pretty cool. At least we know it's not dead, but... <laughs> 
Yeah, yeah sadly, it does not have the ability to turn invisible like in the show, but, you know. Oh, and I read somewhere that they uh, they stopped doing that. They only did that for the movie? Probably because it's too expensive. Um, so many like... things changed over the series that uh, it got kind of frustrating because it didn't seem like everybody was on the same page. Yeah, they should have stayed the way the movie was. In fact, they should have turned it, like I said, into a, a series of TV movies instead of a series. That way you could keep the budget up and, and keep the adventures like at least a decent level. That would have been awesome. But hindsight and all that. And... Yeah. Anyway... Alright, so I already said my goodbyes way earlier, so I apologize. This is an awkward end. Um, everybody, be excellent to each other. And Ron, thank you again for another great episode. Guys, we are killing it with this show, and it's all because of you. You have supported us through some serious uh, episodes like where we didn't know if it was going to be successful, and we find ourselves like just huge numbers. Oddly enough, no one really cared about the Miami Vice episode. It's weird. You'd think they would have, but no. Well, maybe, maybe we can plug it some more. And yeah, that's the only episode that make, wasn't popular. Right. Um, like our Chips episode, our Dukes of Hazard episode is obviously the huge one. Smoking the Bandit's huge. Back to the Future, of course, is our big record breaker. Like that massive, that thing is heading Ooh, towards Thank us. you. Yeah, we're headed towards huge numbers on that that I've never seen before. Um, hopefully this is a good launch for uh, Season 2. And like I said, if you uh, have any suggestions for shows we haven't covered yet, let us know. And um, send comments to Facebook on Retro Rocket Entertainment. This is your friend to say goodbye. Say goodbye, Ron. <laughs> good day. <laughs> All right, everybody. Have a good night. <laughs> See ya.